Are you overwhelmed by a seemingly endless list of gardening jobs? Don't feel like that. Hi, I'm Ben, and today I'm going to be cracking on with five essential jobs I make sure I do at least once a week, because they save time later on, and they can save you time too. What are they? Well, let's find out. Now, when I say the word weeding, it probably fills a lot of you with dread, but this is one area where weeding little and often really does pay off because you soon get on top of it. Now, my strategy is just to hunt around, and these are mainly annual weeds, and simply pluck them out and drop them back down where they are, and they'll soon return all those nutrients back into the soil. It's a bit like a kind of green, leafy game of hide and seek, seeking them out and dropping them down. I know it's a bit odd, but I rather enjoy this. It's kind of like a, it's meditative, you know? Anyway, on a hot sunny day, these will soon wither away and tomorrow it's gonna to be sunny and hot, fingers crossed. I've got all these vegetables here grown in dedicated beds and what that does is it zones things quite nicely. So you do one bed, get it weeded, you feel great about it and you move on to the next. I'm also practicing no dig with these beds, which means I just add the organic matter onto the surface each autumn and then the worms turn it in. But one advantage of that, as well as saving time digging, is that it avoids bringing all those weed seeds back to the surface. So once you've kind of weeded out the seeds on the surface, you're really on top of it and it dramatically reduces the amount of weeds you get. Now, I do use my trusty hoe here. I keep it nice and sharp so it glides through the soil surface and severs the weeds nicely. And I find this really handy when I'm not up there in the raised beds, but down here. And I can just make very quick work of gliding through and getting into those hard to reach spots. And it also saves the old back. It's really useful, especially early on in the season when the plants haven't quite fully leafed out yet. And you can just reach over and very quickly reach between them. There's a thing about keeping the soil moving really, so once a week, even if there aren't that many weeds, you can just quickly go over the surface and it stops any weeds that are thinking about rooting, stops them from doing that, so they never actually gain a foothold. And then you'll find over time you just don't really need to bother because there aren't really any many weeds left. There are some weeds which I just leave well alone, especially if they are at the edge of the plot, because they're good for wildlife and they're good for sort of pest predators as well. Case in point are these nettles. And actually, if you look here, there happens to be a caterpillar of a butterfly. But um, that's great, isn't it? To be able to have wildlife right close and personal to what you're growing. It's brilliant. And if you come over here, I'll show you some weeds in the lawn, which I've also left for the same reason. So here on the lawn as well, I leave a few weeds to grow. I say weeds, but they're actually wildflowers. Things like daisies, there's dandelions, there's buttercups, uh, herb robert, there's all sorts of little gems here. And what they do is they provide forage for pollinators like bees and butterflies, which then go on to pollinate the crops. I cut and mow paths through the grass, the longer grass, to keep it looking sort of somewhat tended. And I do cut it occasionally, once every three weeks, say. But by letting the grass grow a bit longer, you're getting more wildlife, and it's all beneficial wildlife that's gonna help you grow good food. In truth, when I'm weeding the plot, I'm also looking at the condition of the plants. How are they doing? Are they healthy? Are there any pests or diseases? And of course, are they getting enough soil moisture? When it's been raining a lot, it's obviously very clear that there's enough moisture. You can see here that the soil's quite dark. It's been raining non-stop for a month, so I'm pretty confident there's enough moisture in there. But in, if it's hot and it's the summer, the way to check, I, uh, the way I do it anyway, is just sink a finger in down to about the second knuckle and just feel down. And if it feels cool or, you know, ever so slightly damp, then you know there's enough moisture there. Now, when it comes to watering, the solution isn't little and often, it's the opposite. It's infrequently and loads. So I like to go over it, give it a really good puddling, really good soaking, walk off, do the next bit, and then come round and do it all again. So you're really soaking down. That way you're not just soaking the top little bit there, you're getting down a few inches or five centimeters or so, right down to where the roots are. And that means you only really need to water once a week, or if you're somewhere really hot, perhaps twice a week but it makes it a lot easier. Now, where possible, I prefer to use rainwater. It's got a slightly lower pH, which is better 
for plants. And I just kind of think using rainwater is somehow more natural. Those absolutely fine to use mains water as well. A little tip, and I didn't realize, it didn't even occur to me until someone suggested this, is if you can, if you've got two watering cans, is to fill both of them up and then you get a nice kind of balance when you're off to water. And also it saves time running back and forth to the water barrel. So the paths between my beds, I like to keep nice and clean and weed free. Having nice tidy paths, it's a bit like having a well-organized office or a, a tidy sock drawer even. It's kind of just tidy, it's motivating, and it makes you feel encouraged to crack on with the jobs. So every week I just come through, there's always a weed sneaking around at the sides of the bed, so I just hoik them out, just let them drop again where they are. And that means there's less hiding places for sort of things like slugs as well. I've chosen to top my beds up here with uh, these bark chippings and that's a really great home for predators like ground beetles and they come in and they obviously take care of the pests in the beds and all this gradually rots down and then I top it up again. I've got a tree surgeon friend who drops me off a bulk bag of wood chippings every now and then but they're quite affordable in sort of garden centres and nurseries you can pick them up and just top up beds with whatever you got really. I've also um I just take rough prunings as well. I just dump those on and they eventually rot down too. Having paths covered with wood chips also just keeps it from turning into a quagmire. As I said earlier, it's been raining almost non-stop for a month and yet I can still kneel here. It's just been raining this morning and it's still perfectly dry. The beds are about one to one and a half feet, that's 30 to 45 centimetres wide, which is enough to get a wheelbarrow around. Some of the paths are a little bit narrower than ideal, but I can still get my big Sasquatch feet in between them when I'm doing my weeding, and that's the important thing. So make sure your paths are wide enough for you to work comfortably so you're not sort of squeezing in an awkward angle. Gardening is many things, but one thing it certainly isn't is static. Plans are fluid, and evolve very much with the weather and the progress of the season. So as well as getting meal prep done and tidying up ready for the new week, one thing I like to do at the weekend is check the garden plans and see how everything's coming along. How's it all looking? Does something merit more or less space? And should the plan be tweaked accordingly? If I check the plan in say July, about a month from now, I can see that there's already quite a few gaps appearing. So I need to be thinking ahead to what I can sow right now so I've got young plants ready to drop in place. I'll also look at the accompanying plant list to see how it's all going, making a note of anything that really needs sowing or planting right now before that window of opportunity passes by. And then with an idea of what I need to sow, I can go through my seed box and get out the seeds I'm going to be sowing over the coming week, ready to do just that. Gardening is full of successes and failures, and I like to keep a track of all of that to inform next year's decisions. Taking these few moments now will potentially save a lot of heartache and time later on next year. Maybe you're not a master of procrastination, but I have to confess I am, and I'm a dreadful one for putting off those jobs that I just don't really want to tackle. But like anything, if you tackle one of those big jobs, just one of them at a time, each week you'll soon get through them and it's really empowering and you'll feel great for it. Jobs like sorting out and tidying this lot or sawing out this sycamore before it shades all the beds there or weeding through and finally getting on top of this bindweed. Last week I weeded through this totally overgrown bed and now I'm planting it with flowers to attract pollinators like butterflies and bees. It feels so much more manageable already Behind me is another project I need to tackle. I'm going to put this camera up in a tree and set it on a time lapse to see just how much I can do in 20 minutes. And there we go, 20 minutes later, and I've already made quite a good dent on it. I don't know why I put it off for so long. It just goes to show breaking down those big jobs into manageable parcels suddenly makes them so much less intimidating. 
What are your must-do weekly gardening jobs? I'd love to know, so drop me a comment below and keep the motivation coming with this playlist of helpful hints and gardening ideas. I'll catch you next time.